morning, good morning, good morning. It's bright and sunny on the outside where I'm at. I don't know where you are, but I just want to wish you good morning. It's a terrific Thursday morning here on Whispering Hope. And we have in the house two champions of the Bible, Pastor Onisi Lefleur and Pastor Lorenz Challenger. And I am here the Challenger. And this week we're looking at the topic, Beware of Covetousness. Beware of covetousness. And so, Pastor Challenger, I'm going to ask you to pray for us to open up. I think I've been asking Pastor LaFleur more times than I did ask you. So, to shift it around, we're going to ask just to invite God's presence as we deal with this subtle but yet very much deadly sin, covetousness. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our study for today. Just before we go into our study, let us bow in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for another day. We want to thank you for your wonderful love, for your amazing grace. As we encounter your word today, O oh God, I pray that your Holy Spirit may impress upon us those things and it may change us, O oh God, into the individuals that you have us be. So I pray for your Spirit's guidance in our study today. And I pray that you may continue to bless us abundantly is our prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So when you hear this topic, beware of covetousness. What comes to your mind before we jump into Thursday's lesson? What jumps out at you when you hear beware of covetousness? Pastor the flower starts with you and then we go to Pastor Challenger. Well, actually, when I read this caption, beware of covetousness, my first response was, hmm. What does covetousness have to do with my salvation? Mm -hmm. Because as a Christian, I don't think I'm covetous. So let me see what the author really says about covetousness. And then let me see how the light shines on me. Amen. Pastor Challenger. Well, uh, my understanding of the definition for covetousness, it has to do with me desiring what is not mine. Um, we can see how that plays out in the whole salvation picture of us desiring things that are not ours and what fuels us. You know, that whole, that whole situation is what causes the problem with covetousness. I want to thank both of you for memory text jumps out and speaks directly to our topic for this week and our memory text comes from luke 12 verse 15 and luke tells us take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses luke 12 15 so pastors your understanding of this text or if i may step ahead this is a challenger as I read the text there found in Luke, take heed and beware of covetousness because for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Cause me to reflect on the fact that the root of covetousness is living in the realm of materialism. That's right. So my life consists of my abundance of material acquisitions. And if that gives me the reason for living, then the drive of materialism suggests that I'll get it at any cost and I'll desire and go after it. So it's sobering to think that my life is more than material things. And what keeps my life together is not the abundance of what I have, but it's my knowledge of God who can provide everything that I need adequately. You know, covetousness has to do with greed. You know, and we see that if we allow greed to control our lives, we see the type of persons that we end up being. You know, it is all about us and not about anything else or anyone else. So that's why it is it's so destructive. And that's why the Bible asks us to beware, to look out for this situation that can grab us and can fill us, inebriate us. Uh, we can look around the world and see what happens to individuals who are greedy for, 
for money or greedy for things. They are consumed by, by this passion and this drive. And many times it is to their own detriment and downfall. You know, so God doesn't want us to be in that situation. So it is, he has given us this clear warning that we are to look out, beware, because life is not about the things that we try to amass. It is more about our relationship with God and how we relate to others. I want to thank both of you for delving into our memory text. Covetousness. You know the lesson today, overcoming covetousness. It points to the fact that covetousness is a matter of the heart. Things like, it's like, it falls in the same category, like pride and selfishness. And one thing, covetousness can go unnoticed. You can be coveting somebody's job or money or possession. And you're so up close and personal with them and they have you as a friend. And they don't even know that you're coveting the little that the Lord has blessed them with. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting that we're called to overcome it. So sometimes it means along our Christian path that some of us may become so ensued in what we can get out of this world. You know, we look over at our neighbors. Life seems so much better over there. And, you know, they say the glass looks greener on the other side. And so we have to be purposeful and peculiar and be particular about how we overcome covetousness. It's deadly and it's deceiving, as the lesson points out. And so it's not as open as things like lying and stealing. You know, if you tell me a lie, Pastor LaFleur, I'm saying, hmm, hmm. Pastor LaFleur is lying. Mm -hmm. And the pastor challenger stole something from me. I know it's missing, so I know it's me and him one living in this house. It's he do it. <laughs> so, but covetousness, on the other hand, there's no real detector. You know, it is inside. It's a matter of the heart. And so we've got to be careful. And so I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And it says, what promise is given here and why is this so important to understand in the context of covetousness? So let me read 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so again, what promise is here given and why is it so important to understand in the context of covetousness? You know, Sister Makeda, as I look at this text, it is very clear that covetousness, as you highlighted earlier, is a matter of the heart. It therefore means that in order to deal with my covetousness, I have got to look inward at me. Because as you rightly so aptly illustrated, if I say something to you that is not true, you detect it easily. But covetousness is something that I have got to introspectively look at and reflectively deal with. But then the Bible gives me this hope that God is faithful to help me deal with even this destructive, spiritually ruining, ruining issue of covetousness in my life. And it gives me the impetus to cry out to God to help me to detect it and help me to overcome it because it can be overcome it is very destructive but i should not despair at it because it can be overcome as long as i deal with me through with god's help in dealing with these issues in my life you know the passage gives us some very powerful lessons you know first thing it says to us and sister challenger again just i want to agree with pastor lafleur you're so correct that it is an inward thing. It's not something that is outward and sometimes over, but it's inward, it's covert, it's hidden. 
you know, deep in the recesses of your heart. So you desire something, you're not necessarily acting on it right away, but it's hidden there and it can lie dormant for a while. And we see the same situation with Satan uh, when he was in heaven. I imagine there are days when he went around and, you know, he, was, he just coveted, he just wanted that desire, that worship for himself. But the passage gives us a, a very clear understanding and a very powerful promise. He says, every temptation that comes our way. So we can say covetousness is a temptation. We see a desire. You know, every temptation that comes our way, that it is common to all of us. So that's one thing we can say, that all of us face this. That's what the passage is telling us, right? It's common to all of us. And it says something next. It says that God is faithful, meaning that we can trust God every time. So there is no situation where we are coveting our hearts that we cannot bring it to God. It says God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation, that desire that we have inside of us, that will be a fruit later in, in doing some acts that are unlike us and some maybe some illegal acts. He says that God can control it if we give it to him. He, and God is not going to allow that temptation that is dormant lying inside of us to be more than we can bear. And if it reaches to that point that we can't bear it anymore, the promise that we're given is that God is going to make a way of escape so that we may be able to bear that temptation so that we do not have to act out. No covetousness is something that lies dormant in us and we look and we see and we desire, it does not have to be a fruit and be born out into an actual act that will bring even more destruction upon ourselves or upon whatever hinders us from getting the desire that we want. So God is giving us this promise today, and it is a very powerful promise that I have affirmed, I believe it, I have practiced it in my own life, I still can, can do these things for us. He can temper whatever our desires are, or those illicit desires. He still can put a cap on it for us, as it were. Thank you guys so much. The next question, how then, in God's power, can we be protected against this dangerously deceptive sin? You know, it says it's common, something that is common among us. It's inward it's in your heart it's not easily detected how in god's power can we be protected against this dangerously deceptive power deceptive sin in god how then in god's power i would like to submit sister challenger that we have to first of all acknowledge this love that god has for each of us that love is not a little boy little girl love it is a love that reaches right down to my deepest welfare everything i need god knows and he loves me sufficiently to provide it for me but it may take me talking to him about the very desires of my heart even if i see the grass looking supposedly green on the other side and i want that grass the relationship that i have with him should allow me to tell him what's on my mind but also realizing that he is loving enough to provide for me what I need. So it will take me making a decided decision to depend on him. Tell him all our sorrows. Tell him all our joys. Tell him all that pleases us. And tell him what annoys. And even tell him to help us through this temptation to grasp the grass that is greener on the other side. Pastor, I agree with you. Yes, we have to be intentional about this. This is uh, such a divisive situation, this covetousness. So we have to be intentional about it. We have to decide that we are not going to go down that road. You know, we are told in, in the passage that we just read before, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 
that God is available to us. So first of all, we have to make that decision. We have to be intentional about it. God, I want to change. I want this situation to be taken from me. I want you to handle it. And is born out even in the Lord's prayer. In the last part of the prayer in 13, verse 13, that says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So it's something that we have to talk about. First of all, we have to arrest the situation and acknowledge that it's there. We have to talk to God about it because we are of freeing ourselves from covetousness. And we have to continue in his word. Covetousness is a sin. We need to make that point. It's a sin. So it follows that same path that we have to be intentional, confess it to God. We have to talk with him about it and acknowledge that he's able to help us. And we have to use his word, God's word in this picture. By saturating ourselves with God's word, we'll be able to overcome not just covetousness, but any sin that comes in our way. The Bible is so, so, so clear in Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. When we hide God's word in our hearts, when we present it before him, when we talk to him about it, he can help us with any situation that comes our way. And that is how we can treat with the sin of covetousness. Like any other sin, like any other situation, we present it before God and he will help us. I'm, I'm sure of it. I have practiced it many times in my own life and he has helped. Amen. Now, I'm going to read Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. It says, covetous is a sin that is invisible. We have been discussing that for the morning. But what does this passage cause us to do? So I'm going to read Isaiah 55, 6 and verse 7. And you're going to tell me from your interpretation of scripture, what it is that God is calling us to do in overcoming covetousness. You see, it says, Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So very clear. It calls upon us to seek God, intentionally seek God. It calls upon us to forsake our ways. It calls upon us to be mindful of our thoughts. And you know, as I read this passage, I reflected on what an old elder said from the church that I grew up in. He used to say, Lord, let me make a covenant with you with my mind and my eyes and my tongue so that I do not think the way you don't want me. And we would laugh as little children eh, in the church. But it was very clear that the text is challenging us to see God, really reach out to God about this issue if I'm to overcome it, to forsake my ways by reaching out to him to watch my thoughts and ask him to help me with my thoughts and really return to a dependence on God because he has our best interests at heart and he is willing to forgive us. Amen. Amen. I agree with you, Pastor. Again, we see here in this passage the intentionality. We have to be intentional about these things and present them to God. And the thing about God is that we deal with individuals on a regular basis, that family members, close individuals, you know, to us. And we may develop a particular reputation among them where we are a particular way and we have to say sorry often. You know, and it comes a point where we as human beings cut off individuals. But God is not like that. God knows our heart, so he sees us from the heart uh, perspective, and he knows when we are truly repentant. And here, we, when we are intentional about this situation, God, I'm presenting this to you again. I'm a human being. I fell. I fail. All these thoughts of covetousness, these desires are coming on me again. You know, we have to be intentional to bring them before God to seek that's what he says seek the lord 
whenever we're in this issue, we, we go to God. Lord, help me again with this issue. It's pervasive in my life. It's taking control of me. I can't manage it. We see again the similarities. And here with uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God is faithful. He will manage these situations for us when we present it to him. In the end, God really does come true for us because of the kind of God he is. Does not want these things to burden us down, does not want these things to destroy our lives because he knows how they can be consuming and how they can destroy us. So he makes himself available to us so that when we bring them to him, you know, uh, intentionally, he deals with us based upon that. And I'm so thankful to God today that he's that kind of God. Whenever I come to him, I have the confidence that he is going to solve uh, whatever I'm bringing before him because I'm intentional about it. Amen. Now, next question is a bit personal. Eh? The next three questions I'm going to ask you, they're a bit on the personal side. You know, but how can we protect ourselves or our hearts from covetousness? There's so many things around us that's so beautiful and so wonderful, you know, that, that nice love for 2023 in the dealer shop that's just inviting and, you know, you see a colleague have one. And you're like, oh man, that has always been my, my dream to own one. Ah, how can he afford that? And all of us work for the same thing. And, you know, you start watching that vehicular kind of house. So how can we, honestly, now, this is where you're putting your business out. How can we protect ourselves and our hearts from covetousness? Because the truth is, we're going to always see nice things. We're going to always see things that we like and things we wish we could own. So talk to me, fellas. So for me, it starts with me recognizing that I'm a sinner. And I have a heart that until Jesus comes... I will be totally dependent on God to deal with every sinful situation in my life. So I first of all got to realize I'm not superhuman. Two, I have to realize to me that I like nice things. I like a comfortable life. And I am not immune from the glamour and the status that materialism brings. I'm not immune to it. Therefore, because I realize how we're bent where I am, where how bent I am in that direction, I've got to I, I've got to confront that I need help outside of me to deal with these things. And in doing so, I need to really be surrendered to God, remembering there is no profit to me if I gain the whole world but lose my soul. And I have to realize that what matters for me on a seal of glory at the end of the day is not position or power. Is not the Porsche in the garage or the Corolla. What matters for me is where I really am with God. Because God will not withhold from me any good gift that will bring glory to his name. So I need to realize that I now live in the realm where everything I do, it's hard. It's not something that comes overnight, you know. But it's really to bring glory to God. And so I may have to wait five years. I may get the 2023 model in 2028, but I'll have a more grateful heart to God. Amen, 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 Pastor. Wonderful. You know, I agree with you with the whole statement of awareness. You know, we have to be always aware of ourselves and be aware do self-evaluation very often as something I do mainly at night before I go to sleep. I I have had many situations where I have coveted, uh, to be honest with you. I have coveted things, you know, have desires of, of wanting things. And first of all, my the first thing that stops me is the fact that I can't I can't afford it. So usually that's a stop. And if I see it pushing me in a direction where 
I have to be compromising. I know that uh, it's not for me, especially if I've prayed to God about it and he has not answered and I keep pursuing it and I'm finding a lot of dead ends and the fact that it is consuming me, I know that there is something wrong right then and there. And then I have made a decision personally that there is nothing, there is nothing that is going to come between me and God. There is nothing that I'm going to hold on and take me to hell or to my grave. We need to understand and be aware of this again. It comes with awareness again. That all these things that we jostle for in life, all these things that we work so hard for in life, when death comes, we can't take it with us. All right? We have to be aware of it. We have to, that awareness has to be part of us. He has to permeate us, that awareness, that we're not able to take it. And, you know, sometimes it is good to listen to individuals who are already gone that way. As a young man, I read the book of Ecclesiastes, and it frustrated me. Until I understood this perspective of the writer, who was somebody who has gone through life and already experienced all the things that people kill for. All the things that people lose their salvation and their sleep and their peace for. And at the end of the day, his conclusion that it is just vanity. And I don't think that anybody who is alive and have any means today would have lived a life like Solomon with such, such grandeur, such posh. And if he, at the end of the day, comes to that conclusion that all is vanity and it wasn't worth it, that, that should inform me that there is something about my pursuit that I have to be aware of. You can't take it with you, brothers, brothers and sisters. It is good to pursue and have these things in life to satisfy you or your ease. But at the end of the day, don't let it cost your salvation. What, if any, have been the consequences in your own life from covetousness? I will be quick to answer on necessary debt. Yes, <laughs> wonderful necessary debt. Mm -hmm. That, but the testimony I can give is when I realized that because of my covetousness that I got into this debt, when I spoke to God, He helped me deal with it. Unnecessary debt. If I'm to follow in your vein, Pastor, unnecessary headaches and heartaches. Sometimes there is that disappointment when you do not meet the mark or when you finally in the end, when you have that thing that you committed so much and you worked so hard for and you realize that it was, was it worth it? You have to have the question, was it worth it? Was it worth all this heartache and headache and going through? Is it worth it? Sometimes when you reach to that point, and I have reached to that point, and I ask myself the question, was it worth it? You know, was it worth all the pains? And some, for some individuals, it's, was it worth losing your salvation over? That's a deep question that we need to ask. Also. And our final question. What lessons have you learned? What might you still need to learn from them? The big lesson I learned is that I need to depend on God to help me with covetousness because there's always lurking at the back of your mind that this other thing is better and it will make life easier. So I so the lesson I've learned is that not all that glitters is gold and not every glittering gold belongs to me because it may not bring glory to God through me. And I've had to learn that and to be contented in whatever state I find myself, knowing that God can work things out. Pastor, for me, is that last statement that you made, be content with whatever situation that you're in. You know, I have learned that and I continue to learn it, you know, because sometimes the things that we think we need in life are not always the things that we truly need. And it's only when we depend upon God to order our lives and order our steps can we truly have that contentment with our lives as we need to have. You know, um, one is just during COVID. 
you know, I, I questioned myself. I asked myself a lot of questions. Do I need this? Do I need that? Do I need this? And the things that we worry about so often in life are not necessities all the time. And we just need to have that awareness that God needs to be the one who is placed in the driver's seat of our lives. He's the one that we need to give our lives to and allow to take charge and to take control. Because when we take the wheel, we often mess things up and we are driven by our desires and that greed and that covetousness and it leads down the wrong road. So we need to give uh, God the driver's seat and the steering wheel and we need to depend upon him to take us through every situation in our lives. Guys, we're at the end of our study. We really want to thank both of you for so ably helping us to dig deeper into overcoming covetousness. The truth is, covetousness is something that at some point in our life, we've all been guilty. You, you see something, you desire it at all costs, whether it was good for you or not. But God still loves us in such a way that he has made provision for us to escape as found in our text for today in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And the text continues, God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear. And that's the truth. You know, every time I think of covetousness, I reflect on perfect environment in heaven. And right there and then, covetousness was bound up in the heart of someone who is made in the image of God. And if at that level, Lucifer fell, woe be unto us here, who has sin in our DNA. But God says, if you want to overcome, you got to make a decision to serve and depend on God. Make him a part of your family. You've got to be daily in prayer. Lord, as our good elder from Pastor Nisi's church, that covenant that he made with God, we have got to make that covenant. You know, with our eyes, with our tongues, with everything. Because, you know, so many things that we can covet. And we've got to study the word of God. And so to everybody in Whispering Hope Land, we want to encourage you to trust God, to have a personal relationship with him. You can, over, you can only overcome covetousness if God is the captain in your ship. So you just want to thank everybody for joining us this morning on Whispering Hope. God bless and see you tomorrow on Whispering Hope.